in the first video in our Tech Deep Dive series, there's now a regular feature every Wednesday, we looked at the national grid from generators to DNOs and ended up with 11,000 volts at the local substation nearby to the new charger installation site. Dave Takes It On now completes that journey from the substation to the car. Well, for those who missed the original one, I'll leave the link down below. Please remember some elements of these videos are really simplified for those who are not electrical engineers like me. Well, to summarise, there are two types of electricity, direct current, DC, and alternating current, AC. In the very early days, DC was discovered by simply using different metals dipped into an acid, commonly vinegar. Well, this became the lead acid batteries that most ICE cars use to start their engines to this day. But it faced two problems. Well, first, all devices use different voltages and currents, a bit like phone chargers used to be. So picking a voltage to transmit to everyone was almost impossible. Second, scientists and engineers found that generating the high DC voltages needing, needed for transmission to customers a distance away, almost impossible. Low voltage transmission lost so much power, it was useless for that purpose. Well, alternating current removed that problem when they discovered ways to make extremely high voltage, where transmission losses would be a relatively small amount, well within acceptable financial limits. And with this lower cost and the invention of transformers to change that voltage whenever they needed to, it took off and is still used today. However, even today, it is not possible to store AC electricity. That technology for DC storage is in the form of batteries. Many of these are mobile devices, you can carry them anywhere. Mobile phone, torch, EV, right up to massive static grid-connected storage you definitely can't carry around. So the grid works on extremely high voltage AC and your EV works on relatively low voltage DC. Well, that's where transformers come in. In simple terms, they're just two coils of wire, one inside the other, each having different number of turns. So maybe one transformer has coil one with 100 turns and coil two with 1,000. If you put electricity into one, then when it comes out of the other, it is either 10 times higher voltage or 10 times lower voltage, depending on which coil you put it into first. So now we're down to just 11,000 volts and generally it's at 50 hertz, meaning it alternates switches back and forth 50 times a second. Well, that passes through a transformer that reduces it to 450 volts, 50 hertz. In this photo, the incoming 11k voltage is in the red cables and just behind here is the transformer. Well, this then is fed into the distribution circuitry on the left then underground cables take that to the chargers. It's not technically correct to call these devices chargers. The bits we use, those with the cables attached and the screen for payment, are not chargers. Where those chargers actually are is also not quite so simple. And Tesla use a very different system to grid serve, making it more complicated. Well, first, let's look at the big white boxes behind these grid serve chargers. That is where the 450 volts AC three-phase power supply arrives. Three-phase simply means three parallel circuits alternating 120 degrees apart, so giving three times the power. In here, the voltage is regulated to that figure that the charger uses. Most chargers, most EVs operate at around 400 volts. A very few EVs now operate at 800 volts, which many claim to be better and faster. Probably isn't. Charging speeds and times of a Tesla Model S, 400 volt, and a Porsche Taycan 800 volt are very little different in real life. The main reason for the difference is technical. It's to do more with manufacturing and weight. Anyway, there are very few 800 volt chargers in the world at this stage. Probably somewhere around about a thousand. So for this video, we're going to assume every charger we're looking at is 400 volts. These cabinets take in the 450 volt AC three phase and first convert the AC into DC, which both the charger and the car use. These are called AC-DC converters, strangely enough, and they do just that. So now our electricity is in DC, it enters a voltage regulator. Well, this device balances the input and the output so that when the load or the incoming power varies, the other doesn't. So it's just like in your home, when you turn on a kettle, the house lights don't dim. Well, they shouldn't. 
So what so when you plug in your EV? So the power remains constant. And conversely, if the incoming voltage drops or surges, the output doesn't. So at this point, we now have a stable voltage around 400 volts DC, carefully regulated to be stable, and that is fed through an underground cable to the charger, which I've already said actually isn't. Well, look at your smartphone. It operates at around 4 volts DC, or all technical circuits do. It comes with a charger, which plugs into 240 volts AC, so it does two things. It changes the AC to DC, then drops the voltage to around 5 volts. But it is, is just a power supply. It does not communicate with your phone and ask it if or how much power it needs. It just puts out 5 volts regulated DC. What controls the charging of a mobile is a software program in the phone. It works out how much power it needs and disconnects from the charger when the battery is as full as the phone allows. Likewise, an EV decides how much power the battery needs and how much it can handle. Many do not realise that a battery is a simple chemical reaction that either gives out electrons, electricity, or takes it in and stores it. And all chemical reactions proceed faster at higher temperatures. Trying to shove full charging power into an icy cold battery will destroy it. So the car stops that. It controls how much power it can take, then regulates that until the battery reaches the state of charge that the driver's programmed, or 100% whichever is lower. There's nothing for the driver to do. This is automatic. It protects your battery. So, a really f philosophical question, which bit is the charger? In simple electrical terms, big white cabinets are the converters and regulators. The car has the BMS software that controls how much and how fast the car accepts the electricity from the charger, making what we call the charger a mere dispenser of stable regulated electricity. Anyway, after this situation can get very murky indeed. How much power is taken from the substation during installation versus how much power all of the chargers together, each delivering the maximum 350 kilowatts in this case, can use? And here different installations will make different decisions. If we go back to houses, houses are rated generally in the UK at 230 volts and 100 amps. Yeah, I know there are some houses that got 60 amp limits, but they're fairly few and far between. Therefore, each house is quite capable of 230 times 100, or 23 kilowatts. Again, no power is measured in kilowatts, storage is measured in kilowatt hours. So each house has 23 kilowatts at its disposal, and there's well over 30 million houses. So if every single house maxed out its, maxed out its consumption, it could easily use 23 kilowatts for 168 hours in a week and for 52 weeks in a year, making more than 200,000 kilowatt hours. And at 30 pence a kilowatt hour, that would cost each house over £50,000 a year. Well, luckily, we only use, on average, around 3,000 kilowatt hours per year. And our bills are a lot less, still expensive. And the grid knows this, so while each house can max out at 23 kilowatts, most never do. And often, they're barely ticking over at well under 1 kilowatt overnight. So they look at the historical consumption data and do calculations and then deliver what the grid is likely to actually use throughout the day and throughout the year. And it works. We get very few blackouts due to excess demand, even at peak times. So the power provided from the substation to the charges is also calculated to be enough for each of the charges to be able to have as much power as it needs at any one time. Quick example, these charges are rated at 350 kilowatts. There are probably not even as many cars in the whole world that can actually charge at this rate to max out all the existing 350 kilowatt chargers in existence. There is just no need to supply enough electricity to do that. Realistically, most people charge at around 100 kilowatts. Yeah, plug in when you're almost totally flat with a nice warm preconditioned battery and your car will peak a lot higher, some of them well over 200 kilowatts. But that drops quite rapidly. And then once you get above 80% state of charge, few cars will get much more than 50 kilowatts, and above 95% you're lucky to get into double figures. But as the technology improves to allow more cars to charge at faster rates than today, so the power supplied to the chargers might eventually need to be increased. And that might be as simple as running an extra cable from the substation to the main incoming control box. Well, Tesla's different, and so soon will be GridServe. 
A flow chart shows that the substation supplies the distribution cabinet, which then supplies an individual cabinet, which then supplies an individual dispenser, the bit with the cable and the plug. Other networks put the voltage regulator, an AC-DC converter, inside the charger. Tesla combines the roles of the individual cabinets and moves that back into the distribution cabinet, meaning that they have no need for an individual cabinet for each dispenser, as can be seen, or rather not seen, here at Trenton Garden Supercharger. Combining these roles means far less equipment, less cabling, much quicker installation times. And the installers I met at Sandbach recently told me that future grid serve installations will also do away with these separate cabinets, as Tesla has always done. Is it not strange to you? Tesla invent the Gigapress, which allows them to make single rear and front castings for production in one piece instead of welding hundreds of individual pieces together. Legacy Auto, which has been in the business for over 100 years, looked at that and dismissed it. Then thought, well, hang on, let's think about it. And now they're adopting it, why Tesla and Ford have just announced. Well, likewise, the electricity industry, which has also been around for over 100 years, has used these cabinets all that time. EV charging networks simply copied standard practice, seemingly without any thought. Well, Tesla comes along, does away with them from day one, and now GridSurf say, hey, yeah, let's copy them. It makes installations easier, quicker and cheaper. Osprey is one of the very few of the others to have followed Tesla's approach, quietly, for years. Who will follow next? Instavolt? Fastned? Well, hold on, I hear you say. Fastned don't have those cabinets behind their dispensers, nor do Instavolt. Hmm, I agree. That's because the chargers themselves are huge and bulky, and those cabinet components are inside. Compare the slim, sleek design of the Tesla V4 and the Osprey 150 kilowatt dispensers with the bulky giant of a beast used by Fastnet and Instavolt. OK, we're at the end of this journey. Apologies for the oversimplification of some elements. Try to keep it easy to follow and enjoyable. If there is enough demand, I can go deeper. Let me know in the comments. Well, future videos in the series will look at what happens to that electricity when it enters the EV. Please subscribe so you'll be notified when that and others in the tech series on Wednesday night are released. Thanks for watching. I'm Dave.